Yes, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, league fans around the feckin' world, welcome to Rune Terra. What's the crack, lads? My name is DV Geek, and yes, today we're going to be exploring Rune Terra. The world that the League of Legends video game is based on, from all of the cinematics and trailers that we've seen here on the channel, um, everything that has happened in those trailers, a lot of that stuff has taken place, if not all of it, has taken place in Rune Terra. And today in this video, I'm going to be doing something that I'm not sure too many people have done, and that is exploring this map thoroughly reading the lore reading the history and just having a good time doing it so if you guys are excited for this video make sure you leave a like to show your support and of course do not hesitate to hit that subscribe button and show the support to the channel even more by hitting the join button and access early videos of league of legends coming in the next few days so ladies and gentlemen let us begin our journey of rune terra this is gonna be freaking awesome i cannot wait so this is the map it is split up in several different regions i believe we have tarragon we have uh Demax demacia frejord i may completely massacre the names of these places so i do apologize we have noxus we have Piltover and Zahn, they count of, as one. We have Ionia, or Ionia, uh, Bilgewater, Shadow Isles, Ixtal, and Shurima. So, we're going to start things off, I think, in the bottom left here down in Tarragon. So, let's see what ventures here. So, we have something here. This is Mount Tarragon. Some of these places might seem familiar to any of you that have seen the cinematics and there might be some here that I might find familiar to myself as well. But let's read this piece of information here. Governance, Tribal Theocracy, um, Attitude Towards Magic, Aspire, Level of Technology, Low, okay. General Environment, Harsh Mountains, well we can see that. A mountainous and sparseless inhabited region to the west of Shurima. Tarragon boasts the tallest peak in Runeterra, located far from civilization. Mount Tarragon is all but impossible to reach, save by the most determined pilgrims chasing some soul-deep yearning to reach its summit. Those hardy few who survived the climb return haunted and empty, or changed beyond all recognition. I absolutely love that. So, let's firstly read about the Carved into Rock. Architecture of Mount Tarragon. Okay, so this is the path. Um, circumscribing the mountain is carved into the rock, creating shelters that protect the Rakor. Oh, look at this freaking artwork. It's beautiful, isn't it? Look at that. I love this. Carved into the mountain. The Rakor chiseled markets, home, homes, bridges, and ceremonial chambers using the shapes of the mountain itself. The circular patterns of the vaulted stone ceiling serve as reminders of the celestial beings who created this place. Some families inscribe symbols in the rock beside their homes to mark momentous events and are able to trace their stories of their history for generations. That is freaking beautiful, isn't it? Life on the edge. Look at that. They're literally living on the edge of a mountain. Using the natural uh, curvature of the rock, the Rakor sculpted stone pathways and stairs into the lower parts of the mountain. Thick cloth hangings held into place by woven robe fibers provided shelter from the wind and snow. Oh my god, such a beautiful world. Pathways and caverns. Uh, at certain un enclaves around the mountain, the Rakor carved pathways into the labyrinth labyrinthian caves and tunnels within the rock here they take shelter from the most perilous storms and impossible conditions jesus look at that ancient thresholds ancient gateways of glittering metals mark the end each inhabited uh, base the record celebrate moment they cross the thresholds and continue their revolution under the sun's bright path jesus Temple of the Solstice. 
The entrance to the Sol Solari Temple on the eastern slopes of the mountain is carved from gold vined marble. Windows are carved into the temples at precise locations, precise locations, excuse me, so that the light of the sun floods the inner chambers during the solar equinoxes and solstices. I can never pronounce that freaking word. Scribes and acolytes sometimes spend the winter months sheltering in the relative warmth of the temple, conducing divine rituals to call upon the power of the sun and charting the mo movements of the stars during times of strife a, sol a solari priest sol solari priest might meditate in the outermost sanctum for weeks without food or water subsisting merely on the divine sustenance of the sun the source of life God, this kind of stuff just gives me chills, man. It's a good thing I got a nice hot cup of coffee here. Because I love this stuff. It gives me chills. Um, Solary Prayer Shrine. Look at this art, man. It's so gorgeous. In this sacred space, aspirants seek a place in the Rahorak. The Solaries, the Solaries the Templars. I'm so shit at reading this stuff, man. If the aspirant proves worthy, they are inducted into the elite group of warriors. This shrine was constructed to showcase major celestial events, which are visible from its carefully placed windows. The farewell ceremony. Look at this, man. Oh, God, the mountainous areas. This is just beautiful. This metallic stone fell from the mountain long ago and is now used to mark a delineation between the Rakaron camp and the unknown terrors of the mountain. In a sacred farewell ceremony, the climbers beginning their ascent are celebrated. This day marks the moment when the fate of their souls are given into the hands of Targon. These climbers will likely never be seen again. Wow. I mean, that is incredible, isn't it? The Rakor. Okay, so this is the Rakor. Look at them. People of Mount Targon. A name meaning tribe of the last sun. The Rakor. Is it Rakor? Rakor? I'm not sure. I'm going to say Rakor. Worship the power of the sun's light above all else. Those who devote their lives to these religion are known as the Solary. While the her heretical Lunary secretly worship the light of the moon. The warriors. Man, look at them. Rakor priests teach that when their sun is destroyed, all will diminish into darkness. So its warriors must be ready to fight those who seek to extinguish its light. To the Rakor, battle is an act of devotion and offering to keep the sun's light shining. I absolutely adore this, man. I really do. Um, that is so cool. Uh, what else we got? We have the Solary. Okay. The dom oh, okay. Look at them. All right. The dominant religious group on Mount Targon, the Solary believe the sun is the source of all life. To them, all other light sources are false and a threat to the future of their people. On the slopes of the Mount Targon is the Solary Temple, where disciples are thought to, to the scriptures of their fate. Their warrior Templars, the Rahorak, practice for years under the harshest conditions so they can devote or defend the land against invading armies and execute heretic, heretics, her, heretic, I can't read, heretics with divine righteousness. Oh man, this is the, look at, he looks so freaking cool, doesn't he? My god, the, the Rahorak. Elite warriors of the Solary practice for the years under the harshest conditions believed to be blessed with the strength and vir virility of the sun. They train themselves to be less susceptible to the cold. <laughs> uh, the Zenith Array. <gasps> Whoa, look at that. Astronomers uh, meticulously track the path of stars. Planets, nebulae, and comets in hopes that they may reveal the will of the aspects. Golden astrolabe? Okay. 
Solary priests keep a watchful eye on movements of the heavens, using astrolabes to measure the movement of celestial bodies said to predict future events. Okay, I'm whiting out a bit. I'm too bright, so I'm gonna just darken the camera. So I'm not too bright. There we go, it's a little better. Weapon designs are ornate and gilded to reflect the divine light of the sun and are often displayed on the outside of armor. Wow, that's so cool. Um, that was the Solary. Now we have the Lunari. Okay. Culture of the Mount Targon. Look at them. So majestic. An ancient underground sect, the Lunari worship the holy light of the silver moon. They practice their beliefs in secret, hiding from the Solary who seek expel the Lunari from the mountain forever. Some say long ago that the two groups coexisted, living in peace and worshipping the many celestial bodies as one people. That's crazy, isn't it? How different beliefs can separate um, groups of people over the years when, you know, when it all began, everybody believed in the one thing. Uh, priestess of the Moon. The lunar chart celestial movements to divine future. Certain priestesses wear necklaces of mirrored moon glass, believing that reflections can reveal even greater truths. Wow. Blinding light. Culture of the Mount Targon. Some lunar seer seers bind their eyes during the day, training their eyes to see only in darkness. For only under the pure light of the moon is truth revealed. What? Could you imagine if they took off those blindfolds when the sun is out glaring? Jesus, they'll blind themselves. Okay, so lunary weapons. Look at that. Is it glass? Lunary weapons designs are elegant, spare, and easily concealed, crafted from iridescent orb stone. Oh, wow. That's freaking cool. Okay, so that was the, the lunary. Now we have life on the mountain. With their daily migrations across steep slopes, tribes of mountain Targon carry as, as few belongings as possible. Wow, okay. Heavy tools and equipment are stored in shelters around the mountain and repaired or made as needed. Tethered pulley systems help transport belongings up and down the slopes. God, that would have been such a harsh environment to live in. Could you imagine just trying to get to the shop? You have to climb up a freaking mountain and you have to bring your little bits of supplies to actually get there? Climbing gear. Even young children of the Rakor are trained to use hooks and picks gear that is essential for survival on the mountain. Whoa, religious items. Fragrance, incense, and stone carved offering bowls filled with powdered meteor dust are used in religious rites. Look at that. I mean, the amount of work and writing that went into this stuff, it, it is, it's truly admirable. Like, I really like that. Wow. So that was Targon. We got all of that information from just Mount Tarragon. So we're going to um, read into this here. Targonian beasts. Beasts of the mountain. Animals of the mountain are uniquely primed to survive under the coldest weather conditions. With thick layers of fat and woolly furs. Whoa. To in insulate from bitter winds and snow. Cloven hooves provide support on steep slopes and narrow footholds, while hooked claws easily latch onto ice. Dude. Oh man, that's so cool. Look at this. This is the Ibic. Look at the size comparison. I love how they do that. They show the guy, like a normal human being, average size, and the size of the Ibic. Jesus. The Ibic are rare sol sol solarity, sol solitary Herbivore. All the herbivores dwells in the lower plains of Mount Targon. I'm, gl I'm guessing this guy's glad he's a herbivore. Um, during the winter months, the Ibic is often covered by snowfall as it hibernates and its, and its rough slate-colored skin helps disguise it amongst the builders. The builders, the boulders, builders, what the fucking builders? <laughs> uh, Tamu, alright, so they're much smaller. Look at them! They look like old wise men. Tamu are intelligent creatures raised by tribes in vast flocks. Their lush coats are sheared by by yearly and woven into warm clothing and other textiles. Whoa! So they're like they're like sheep in a way. Bolar. Bolar? Bolar? Bolar. <laughs> Famous for the trilling cry it emits before swooping for a kill. Ooh, the predatory bolar moves in long gliding leaps along thermal 
currents with aerodynamic feathered limbs and loves to prey on stray tamu. That's a, that'd be a scary one to come across, wouldn't it? Urbok. Why do I have a feeling humans use these to write? The mane of the cave-dwelling Urbok is coated in a thick oil that the Rakar used to cover their outer garments, making them waterproof. The Urbok used the bone plate on their head as tutorial duels over mountain caves. God, the, the, the craftsmanship and the design that goes into making these creatures you know, it's it's imagination on a different level, and I absolutely adore that. So there's a few other things here: journey of the up the mountain, starting to climb, the test, and the summit. So let's read into these. Journey up the mountain. Mount Targon can be broken into distinct regions, as uh, del de delight de delineate deline delineated. By patterns in the rock and marked increase in hazardous weather conditions, difficulty of the climb, and increased death rate, the upper levels of the mountain expand and contract as if the land itself were alive, marking it impossible to map a rel reliable pathway to the top. Each ascend is different as the climb magically stretches. Some climbs can last for months while others reach the peak in just a day. What? How? four seasons look at this oh my god i just want to go outside and explore the base of the mountain experiences a variety of weather creating climates where the record can hunt and forage for food herd animals and sustain life during spring and summer the flora and the fauna thrive making everyday life possible even on such steep slopes man i could just sit here and just admire this freaking view Look at that. That is so beautiful. Like, I'm in... Oops, I'm in Pinterest. I'm in, like, absolute awe from that. That is gorgeous, man. Okay, so, seasonal migration. Greenery grows lush throughout the otherworldly ridges of the mountain during the summer months when fresh water is plentiful and shepherds herd their flocks to graze on the slopes. To the record, these gargantuan patterns in the rock are proof that the mountain was forged by the divine beings. Well, to be quite honest, a lot of this stuff is quite relatable to our own world. They say that the pyramids of Egypt were built by supreme beings that came down years and years ago. Um, they say Mayan ruins. A lot of places that we found around the world that cannot be explained have been put there because of supreme beings so i like that starting to climb the initial ascent this is going to be exciting stuff look at this lads look at that I, you cannot tell me you're not speeches from looking at this stuff man the initial ascent living in the shadow of cyclopean structures of monumental scale the record believe they were called to the mountain by mysterious power some believe that the patterns in the rock were once a map of the realms beyond the heavens. Others say the markings warn of a day when a great war will ravage the land and set brother against or brother against brother. Despite such speculation, the true origin and purpose of these patterns is the rock remains a mystery. So cool. Look at that. Who's this guy? Look at him. Gosh, he's got a harsh environment to get to, doesn't he? Wow. Okay. Otherworldly perils. A lake, frozen millennia ago, was slowly pulled up the mountain toward Targon Prime. Targon Prime. No matter how well trained a climber, the thin atmosphere and the countless, per countless perils of mountain mean that nearly all who attempt to reach Targon's peak die on their climb. Well, I'm not really surprised there, dude. I have very little faith in you, my man. Um, that's incredible. Jesus Christ, uh, wh where did I leave off? Uh, nearly all who tend to reach targets will die on their climb. The bodies of the dead freeze where they fall, permanently preserved in the thin, frigid air of the mountain and serving as a dark warning to those who come after. God, could you imagine all of the frozen corpses? Some climbers encounter divine visions and tests of the character and fate. They might encounter ghostly images of loved ones they must abandon on the slopes to continue their quest. No, that's called hallucination. Um, 
uh, hallucination or personifications of their deepest fears yeah again hallucination i mean when the mind is put under you know a lot of constant strenuous pressure from temperatures or just real harsh conditions you begin to hallucinate and i think that's what this is um and others fight past grotesque beasts encrusted in ice with teeth of sharpened stone. Well, that's something that would suck. Each path to the summit is vastly different so much that the length of the climb can range from a single night to several months. Holy shite balls. That's crazy. Now we have the test. The impossible climb. This is going to be interesting. Look at this. Oh my god. I can just... These are wallpapers. These are all wallpapers. Unforgiving to the even the most adept climbers, the upper slopes of Mountain Targon are plagued by frigid winds, arctic storms, and frequently... Are f and frequent avalanches. Jesus. Its thin air makes every breath laborious and painful. Those who survive the climb... Describe bitter nights spent sheltering from the unrelenting cold where they claim to witness strange visions of ethereal, ethereal figures. The most per perilous elements of the climb are not its climate, but the way in which it tests the very character of each climber. The record viewed the ascent as a test not merely of strength and resilience, but of spirit and soul, as the climbers encounter visions that distract them from their ascent. Some prove benevolent, leading lost climbers to the safest path during a snowstorm. Or helping the exhausted rise once more. God, I absolutely love this stuff. Look at that. Wow. Patterns of the dead. Travelers sometimes climb in groups to assist each other on the ascent. When a climber is grievously wounded or exhausted beyond all movement... No hope of rescue is possible. As any attempt would be a suicide mission, the bodies of the dead do not decay at such heights, for seemingly meld into the rock, slowly twisted into the circular patterns and ridges of the mountains. Holy crap, that is dark. Eternal winter. Whoa. At higher altitudes, bitter winds and perilous snows overcome the seasons, creating an everlasting winter. Here, the otherworldly shape creates strange patterns and rock formations, forming an alien landscape perilous to any stray wanderers. Plants and animals are rare sights in the thin atmosphere and cold climate. Jesus. A never-ending winter. Whoa, I, I'm literally cold right now reading all of this, man. Hopefully we go to a more, a more warmer place after this. Now this is Mount Targon's Peak. Whoa! Dude! That is insane. Fucking hell. Once in a lifetime, here we go. In the rare event when a worthy mortal successful ascends Mount Targon's Peak, the heavens open in a dazzling display of cosmic aurora. Few ever bear witness the radius sight far above the cloud line and beneath the glittering stars, where a beam of light emerges from the peak beyond the mountain summit. It is said that the immortal godlike being dwell in a city of gold and silver. Wow. That's incredible. If can you guys do me a favor because my memory is just shocking. If there's any lore that kind of, you know, connect with some of the cinematics that we've seen, please let me know. Um because I really want to go back and see if I can see some of these areas in the cinematics and really kind of fanboy out over. Glimpse of the beyond. Oh shit. Nearly all who survived to reach Targon Speak see nothing more than an empty pinnacle, rocky and bare. In the extraordinarily rare event where the aspects choose a worthy hero to act as their mortal vessel, it is said that the very air shimmers with stardust as a portal opens atop the mountain. Some say the faint ghost of a brilliant city of silver and gold is just visible beyond the veil. 
and divine light shines in bright and vivid colors as a celestial being descends from Targon Prime. I mean, just like this stuff has so much potential to be a series of movies or an incredible open world video game. Like I'm down for either or both. I would love both. I feel like this world needs to be explored more in the film industry. So that was Mount Targon and its beasts. Which brings us over... Um, whoops, 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 whoops. Clicked the wrong thing. Back into the map, back into the map. Okay. So we explored Targon. Okay, so now it's time to explore Shurima, Fallen Desert Empire. Okay, so we're, we're, we're heading into warmer climate now, lads. So let's see what we've got here. Okay, so we have the City of Gardens. We have Zanathia Cascade. Okay, there's a few places here, um, but we're going to read this here. Life in Shurima. Upper class city dwellers. Whoa. Okay. Low class city dwellers. I love how they drastically change the artwork. Scavengers. Oh my god, look. Shurim scavengers live by looting food, valuables, and trade goods. Mostly, they venture into the ruins of abandoned sand wreck cities. Scavengers are prime targets to ra for raiders when moving on foot, so will often ride sand swimmers to avoid ambush. So scavengers literally go to dangerous places just to survive. Like, you know, even though they're scavengers, I bet they're tough. Whoa, look at this! Dormant Riders. Nomads of Shurima. Dormant Riders use claw grips to traverse the complex series of ropes that connect the mobile village dwellings. Once a rider becomes too old or infirm to run the ropes, they are lowered to the ground to live out the rest of their days as a land dweller. What? I mean, how many ropes can they try? Like, I can't imagine them getting very far. Raiders. The raiders of the Shuram have survived not through trade, but through violence. These bands of marauders often attempt to blend into the environment in order to lure unsuspecting travelers into traps before killing them, taking their belongings, and, in very rare cases, eating them? What? So some of them are cannibals? What the fuck? That's messed up. Okay. Oh, oh no, yeah, this is just further information. We won't get into that. Um, Amumu. <laughs> Amumu was his name. So this is actually shows all the champions that actually live in this region. Okay, so let's um, read this here. So, governance, divine empire, level of technology unknown, attitude towards magic, covet, general environment, arid desert. Shurma was once a thriving civilization that spanned the southern continent, left in ruins by the fall of its god emperor. Over millennia, tales of its former glory became myth and ritual. Now, its nomadic inhabitants eke out a life in the deserts or turn to mercenary work. Still, some dare to dream of a return to the old ways. Wow. Okay, so let's um, start things off in Zonthia Cascade. Whoa, environments in Shrima. Look at that! Jesus! The shifting tides of the desert has been known to carve paths through bare rock, tumbling over the cliff faces in massive sandals. Traditionally, Shurimans toss beloved objects into the sands as gifts to the ascended. As a result, such falls are often lucrative. Spots for treasure hunters. That is... Oh, wow. It reminds me of the San Andreas Fault. Is that what it's called? Oh, that was... That's cool. That's cool, man. That is cool. So that was this. Now we come into the City of Gardens. The once... Thriving, beautiful city was destroyed during the apocalyptic rune wars. It is said that the entire population was annihilated in one terrible night. The city utterly leveled, and all that remains now lives in ruin. 
Jesus. Look at that. That is horrible, isn't it? Look, she's holding a little baby. This guy looks like he's enjoying himself. Let me just move myself there. This guy here looks like he's enjoying himself. <laughs> um, that is... Oh, man. The artwork is just beautiful. So that was the City of Gardens. Um, okay, so we'll make our way here. Endless Plain. Hey, it's this guy! Look! The Endless Plain. Stretching out for hundreds of miles, the Endless Plain is a desolate wasteland that has claimed countless lives over the centuries. Few who attempt to cross it are ever seen again. Um, if the relentless burning heat and lack of water doesn't kill them, the predators and savage raiders that emerge under the cover of darkness likely will. Not this dude, though. We know he's a beast. Wow. That's crazy. So let's move ourselves over here. Dormen Riders. Riders in the storm. Atop the Dormen, some Shuramans choose to live their nomadic existence atop giant, slow-moving creatures known as Dormoon. Really? They literally live on them? Wow. Wouldn't that be a nuisance to those poor creatures? Protected by large, um, chitinous plates, Dormen evolved to survive the perpetual, perpetual drought and harsh conditions of Shrima. The Dormen riders clean the creatures and hunt any airborne pests who venture near, while the Dormen uses unknown senses to locate hidden reservoirs of water. Okay, so they kind of work together. They, they coexist with one another, so that's, that's really cool. Uh, Dormen Riders. Oh! It's these guys again! Okay, so they live up there, but... Ah! And I did say earlier, like, I can't imagine them getting very far, but now I see. Dormen Riders use claw grips to traverse the complex series of ropes that connect the mobile villages to one. So once the rider becomes too old or infirm to run the ropes here, lowered to the ground to live out the rest of their days land as a land dweller. Oh, that's so sad, isn't it? Once they get too old and brittle, they're just casted to the ground. I can't imagine them living too long after that. Okay, so that was Dormen Riders. Let's try Skalashi. Whoa, look at this. Look at them. They're like giant camels. Hardy beasts of burden common across Shurama. Skalashi are ideally suited to the harsh desert environment. Notoriously bad tempered, they are nevertheless treated with great reverence. Their hides often painted with sacred symbols of protection, and their horns hung with totems and charms to own one in often considered sign of considerable prosperity. Wow. I love this, man. Okay, so now we have the Sun Disc. The tool used by the ancient Shuramans to ascend to godhood, it felt, or oh, it fell with the ruin of their empire, but now rises to bathe in the sun's light once more. Gotta take a, a sup of coffee before this one. If you guys are enjoying the video so far, far make sure you leave a like, and I'd greatly appreciate it if you guys subscribe as well if you're new and you're excited for more content like this. I'm gonna do more than just playing League of Legends. I'm going to be exploring the lore and talking about it a lot because honestly it has captured my attention big time. Um, let's see who actually lives here. Azir, Nasus, uh, Renekton, Re Renekton, Renekton, Zrath, Talia, Sivir, and Cass Cassiopeia. Now these are all the legends or the heroes or champions, whatever you want to call them. And they're actually from this area. So rise from the sands. Oh my god, look at this. Jesus, look at that. Whoa. My god. Okay. The Empire the Empire of Shurima was once a thriving civilization that spanned a vast desert. After an era of growth and prosperity, the fall of its gleaming capital left the empire in ruins. 
Over the millennia, tales of the Shurama's glorious capital became myth and relation amongst the descendants of the scattered survivors. Like, it seemed as if this world, this land, was incredible before the war. Like, wow. Like, even, even the ruins, even the remains are impressive. The City of the Sun. Fashioned under the guidance of Targonians, the Great Sun Disk brought the favor of divine, celestial powers to Shurima. Once it was complete, it is said the waters of life flowed through the canyons surrounding the city, bringing life to the desert. Look at this, man. This is just glorious to look at, isn't it? Wow! I just want to explore this, you know? I, I really feel like Riot Games need to make an RPG. Something that we can really explore this world. Look at that, man. I'm just in awe from these pictures. After Shurim's fall, the once great city sank back into the sand from whence it, once, whence it came. Sandstorms filled the basin, buried the sun disk, and left the survivors with nothing but the hard desert. The rebirth. Wow. Look at this. Could you imagine seeing a sight like that? How is that disk floating? The sun disk. There's no information on that, but look at that. Just freaking wow, man. I, I loved everything about that. That was gorgeous. Okay, so now we have Zrima. I don't think I I clicked here. Merchant camp where traders and explorers often gather before venturing into the Great Sigh. Wow, I really liked I think that was my favorite part of the lore on this map so far. That was incredible. Marrowmark. Okay, this is a trader settlement. Erected in the ribcage of some long dead desert behemoth, it is said that the, anything under the sun can be found in the bazaars of Maramark for the right price. Oh, so this is where all the traders go, this is where all the haggling goes, this is where you get your valuables or whatever, or get cheated out or conned, I would presume. The Maramark Market, City of Shrima. You see what I mean? These are this this map. It deserves to be an open world video game. It does. It deserves to be properly explored by gamers. I feel like it could rival the likes of the Elder Scrolls and more. You know, I really do. But look at that. Okay, it's just a picture. No information, but you get you get the idea. Okay, so that was Marrow Mark. Love that. So now we're here in the Valley of Song. Whoa. This remote pass takes its name from the disorienting whistle that results when the wind blows hard enough through the hollow rock structures. Many unwary travelers have found themselves at the mercy of the defend, or deafened marauders who prowl the valley by night. Oh, these guys again! The freaking cannibals! The raiders of Shurma survive not through trade, but through violence. These brands of martyrs often attempt to blend into the environment in order to lure us. Okay, we, we read that. They're basically murderous assholes. <laughs> and these guys, the, Ska, the Shakal. Whoa, these nomadic raiders are known for their agility using hardened bone braces and pole arms to vault towards their victims at terrifying speeds. Whoa. That's crazy, dude. So, scavengers, I think we haven't clicked this one. Oh, we have. No, we haven't. We read this information, though. Yeah, we know that. Oh, look at this. Sand swimmers. These massive creatures. Holy crap! Look at the size of it compared to the dude! Oh, I'm, I'm guessing camouflage is their best feature. They look like little mountains. These massive creatures traverse the desert in psych... psych Sli cyclical patterns feeding on the bugs and other small creatures most desert beasts ignore. Scavengers will often memorize the predictable paths these creatures take and jump onto their backs to ride as far as they wish. I mean, it's, it's a good idea. 
It's one way of traveling, I guess. Whoa, dude. Okay, so we've explored that area there. That was the sun disk. Now it's time to traverse, I'll say. I'm going to go from left to right. So we're going to go down to here. The void. Oh, this looks super interesting. Okay. Okay. So the void. The, unknow the unknowable nothingness. Look, oh, I love this stuff, man. I love this stuff. Screaming into existence with the birth of, univ of the universe, the void is a manifestation of the unknowable nothingness that lies beyond. It is a force of insatiable hunger wading through the eons until its masters, the mysterious watchers, mark the final time of undoing and so usher in total oblivion across Rune Terry. That is the coolest paragraph I've read so far in this, man. The writing that went into that was supposed to deliver chills and that's exactly what I got. I need, I need a drink. This stuff is just so exciting to read. So, in this void, we have Cho'gath. We have Kasaya. Kasadin. Kazix. I'm, I'm just masking these names. Kogma. Malazar. Rek'Sai. And Valkaz. Okay, so we can read about the void. So, let's do that. Oh my god, look at this shit, dude. Who's this? Whoa. That is so cool. Over the centuries, many mortals from the world above have answered the Void's call, or been dragged down against their will. There are those who, among them, few and far between, who have survived the encounter. Through not a single one of them returned unchanged. Wow, an unknowable power. In the abyssal darkness deep underground, it is believed that the first great void creatures to walk the surface of Rune Terra now lie dormant and unseen. If that is true, then they have waited patiently through the millennia, and it must surely now be time for them to rise once more. Oh my god! I mean, the delivery on these! The excitement, man. <laughs> I'm just fanboying out over this. Now, this is the Ikathia, a rebellious vassal state of ancient Shurama. Ikathia is now a barren and forbidden wasteland, and yet amid the ruins, unspeakable horrors of the void are beginning to stir once more. And in this area, we have Jax and Zeline. Fall of Akathia. History of Akathia. Now this is going to be good. <gasps> Holy shit. Are these the creatures from the void? What the hell? Look at this. Whoa. Whoa. A great and terrible battle was fought against the void before the walls of ancient Akathia. In the aftermath, the lands all around the, the damned city became deserted wastes, and its very existence was stuck from the maps of Shurama. It was hoped, perhaps foolishly, that the honors unleashed there, there would eventually be forgotten. Salt the Earth. Whoa. One of the few known ways to combat the void is to starve it with no organic or magical sustenance. Nearby, the void's material growth will slow until it eventually falls into a dormant state. Wow. The Rupture, History of Ikathia. On the outskirts of Ikathia lies the Rupture, evidence of the void itself bursting forth from deep beneath the ground. Yeah, look at that. Wow. Jesus. That's crazy. In an age now lost to history, through the bold and the curious alike have often sought to learn more. Only the most fool-hearted explorer would ever dare venture into the dark spaces beneath. And you know there's some mad lads out there that will do it. Oh, that is so cool. Love that. I love that, man. I love that. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to click over here to... Zaukan? Zaukan. 
Am I pronouncing that right? Um, I'm going to go back out for a second, dudes. So, um, so far we explored Targan, Shurama, um, down here at the void. And now we're here. Ziktal. Okay. So now we have... This place. Actually, I need to read the information. Can we go back? Okay. Z is it Zaital? Perilous Eastern Jungles. Um, governance. Magical autocracy. Autocracy? Auto 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 ah, I can't read! <laughs> anyway. Level of technology. Unknown. Alchemical. Attitude towards magic. Control. General environment, tropical rainforest. Mm. Schedule deep in the wilderness of eastern Shurama, the sophisticated archaeology archaeology city of Zayokan remains mostly free of outside influence, having witnessed from afar the ruination of the Blessed Isles and the softening of Bahura culture. The Zaktali view the other factions of Runeterra as little more than upstarts and pretenders and use their powerful elemental magic to keep any intruders at bay. Okay, so they like to keep to themselves, which is fair enough. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, an unexplored frontier. Wow. Very little is known of Zital's history by those outside its borders. Indeed, over the years, countless expeditions from Noxus, Bilgewater and more recently the Piltover Explorers Guild have delved into the jungle in search of arcane treasures or new territorial claims only to vanish without a trace. R they literally just disappear. Zyokan. In truth, Zaital, I, I know I'm probably not saying this wrong. Is it Ix, Ix, I think it's Zaukan? Ixaukan or is it, I know it's like, I don't know. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing it right. I'm, I'm doing my best. Um, is, is not the un, uninhabited wilderness many imagine. Far from prying eyes and greedy hands, the sprawling arch archaeologies of Zarkon remain safely hidden by the deepest rainforest. The cardinal arch archaeology seat of the rune Yuntal Kas has stood since before the ancient Shurmans raised their first sun disk. Oh, that's beautiful. Mastery over the material realm. Look at that. The arcologies, ar ar arcologies, arcologies are connected by um, intersecting lines of power, and each represents a specific form of discipline of elemental magic. The largest are a home are home to tens of thousands of Zaitali practitioners with a social hierarchy, hierarchy based on the length of time in study, furthering their progression toward ultimate mastery. I don't know why that's all in caps. Um, it just makes things a little bit confusing to read, but man, that's, that's very cool. Um, esoteric knowledge. The future one travels from the cardinal Arcology, the more specialized and prestigious the masteries become high in the mountains, the mages of the relatively small arcology combine their understandings of fire, rock, and magnetism to draw precious metals from the earth, crafting them into exquisite shapes with the merest gesture. Holy shit! Look at this dude! What the shit balls? He's cool. The elemental drakes. Curiously, the abandoned ruins scattered throughout Zaital are home to a surprising number of dragons. These terrifying creatures have not fought alongside mortals since the last days of Shurama's war against the void. Now, for the most part, they seem content just to be left alone. And I'm sure they're just left alone. Don't piss off the dragons. Oh my god. That is so cool. Okay, so anything else here to explore? Hang on. I feel like I missed something down here. So I'm going to go back down here. Because there was places up here to explore. Oh, maybe there wasn't. Okay, there wasn't. Um, so we have Kilash Village, Perthia, and Haraporth. Okay, so we have Zaukon explored. 
Now it's just a matter of going down to the Shadow Isles, Bilgewater, and then here. And then we have how many more regions to explore then? So if we go over here, we have one, two, three, and four. So I'm going to do this. I feel like, yeah, I think that's the best thing for me to do. I'm going to do this in two parts. This is going to be part one. Part two is going to be this side. So we'll do all of these in part two. It might be a shorter video because this one is much bigger. But since we have Zix Zytal, Ix Zixtal or Zytal or Ixtal, whatever you want to call it. We're going to go to Shadow Isles, Bilgewater, and then here. And once we complete them, we'll do part two with Domitia, Freljord, Noxus, and Ionia. So let's make our way to the Shadow Isles. This is going to be interesting. I can feel it. I can feel it. Okay. Shadow Isles, land shrouded by the black mist. <sighs> okay, so the legends that live here are Hecarim, Karthus, Thresh, Callista, Mordkaiser, Mord Mord is it? Yorick, uh, Maokai, and Elise. Governance, none. Level of technology, low, I could imagine. Attitude towards magic, suffer. <laughs> oh my god. General environment, cursed archipelago. Archipelago? That's an interesting word. The Shadow Isles were once a beautiful realm. Really? Long since shattered by a magical cataclysm, now black mist permanently shrouds the land, tainting and corrupting with its malevolent sorcery. Those who perish within it are condemned to become part of it, for all eternity. And worse still, each year the mist extends its grasp to reap more souls across Rune Terra. Oh my god, that's terrifying. Perished lands. Oh. Look at this shit, man. I'm so glad we're doing this, lads. I'm so glad we're doing this. I'm so happy. This is so cool. Flooded cities. Helia, the capital of the Blessed Isles, was located on the coast. As a result, many parts of the city were flooded after ruination. Sun, the sundered vaults of Arcana. Look at that. It's just gorgeous. Everything about this artwork is just gorgeous. Yes, I know it's pain and suffering and darkness and death and all that in this, but it is something to truly behold. The Crater. Oh my god. What the frick? Environment of the Shadow Isles. Once a grand gallery of ancient artifacts, it is now no, now no more than a crater at the heart of the Shadow Isles. It was a grand gallery of ancient artifacts? Yeah, it's not anymore, that's for sure. Look at this, man! Jeez, it's literally hell. That's crazy. Oh, I'm, I'm back in Pinterest again. Whoa, I love that. Um, this is the library keep. Okay. Oh. Whoa. Look at that. This is the library. I'm sure there's some really interesting books there. Okay, so now the fallen entities of the Shadow Isle. This is going to be cool. I knew this is... Ah, come on, lads. This, this would make some epic tattoos. Look at that. Eternal death. Like attracts like. Look at this dude. Holy shit. He's like a medieval Mysterio. I love it. Any mortal who sets foot upon the Shadow Isles will attract the spirits of the fallen. Widow of Forgotten Song. The Widow of Forgotten Songs was a collector of the birds who tried to free them when disaster struck. She now wanders aimlessly, listening for the songs she can no longer recall. I, what? This is a literal walking book! Eternal Scrivener. Scrivener? Scrivener. Many of the humble scribes and archivists of the Blessed Isles perish at their lecterns, unaware of the disaster that had just befallen them. This lost soul now verishly scratches descriptions of its torment on an endlessly unraveling parchment. Whoa! 
Dude, Soul Shepherd. The Soul Shepherd seeks to keep weaker spirits safe from predatory specters. Stop, look at this. Wow. Beyond the Isles. While weaker spirits may only be able to manifest during a harrowing, more powerful entities can always do so, sometimes even venturing beyond the Shadow Isles. This is just beautiful. I love everything about this. Strong willed entities of the Shadow Isles. The most powerful specters retain much of their personality and desires even after their ruination, becoming predatory spirits who may stalk the weak and vulnerable for all eternity. Wow. Thresh. No information needed. He's just scary AF. Hecarim. Oh, that's so badass. I love that. Look at it. Dude. The Shadow Isles are so cool. But so dark and scary. But so cool. Okay, so now we're on to Bilge Water. God, I'm so glad I've done this. Okay, so Bilgewater, Lawless Port City. Okay, so we have a few places to, to look at here. So in this place, we have Fizz, Gangplank, Graves, Ilau, Misfortune, uh, Nautilus, and Pike. And we have two more, but we won't click into that. Gang Syndicates is for the governance level of technology is medium attitude towards magic employ general environment tropical archipelago archipelago i can't pronounce that word bilgewater is a port city like no other home to monster hunters dock gangs indigenous peoples and traders from across the known world almost anything can be purchased here from outlawed hextech to the favor of the local crime lords there is no better place to seek fame and fortune through death lurks in every alleyway and the law is almost non-existent okay so life in bilge water okay so we got a nice bit of information for this one bounty board whoa look at that the closest you can get to laws and governments in the bilge water is a bounty board written on it are the names of the most wanted criminals of bilge water this is like Pirates and stuff. I love it. Ranked by how much would be paid for their heads. It is said that the revered king Gangplank uh, regularly added a silver serpent to his own bounty as an open challenge to the entire city. What a confident dude. A watery grave. Yeah, this has definitely got pirates written all over it. Um, in Bilgewater, the dead are not buried. They are given back to the ocean. The port's graveyards consists of the innumerable floating boyos, or boys, below which are sunk the corpses of the dead. The wealthy are in, interred within expensive submerged caskets below lavish bombing tombstones. So you can see from this image, the wealthy and the not wealthy. Here's a prime example of someone that isn't wealthy. They're just literally put in with an anchor, and here's the wealthy. You can tell you can tell the different levels of wealth with this picture actually. You can start here, you know, which is the bottom. And then here you got a barrel. So somebody's actually in a barrel. We have an actual casket in the background, which is interesting. Um, and then we come to this. It looks like a cannon. So is somebody actually submerged within that cannon? I don't know, maybe. Uh, and then we can come to the real riches. You know, you can really see that. He's even got like a tombstone with an engraving. And like this fancy little thing that he's he's in, or he or she is in, which is super interesting. I love that image. It really gives a good detail of what the hierarchy was here as well. Um, that's so interesting. I love that. Okay, so that was life in Bilgewater. Now we have the unscrupulous people of Bilgewater. Yeah, man, this is totally pirates, man. Bilgewater is home to the serpent hunters, dock gangs, and smugglers from across the known world. For those fleeing justice, debt, or persecution, Bilgewater can be a place of new beginnings for no one on these twisted streets cares about your past. Oh god, okay. Harpooners. 
One of the most important roles in a hunting crew is the harpooner who hooks and slays the beasts. An entire crew will be built around a veteran who can teach others a thing or two along the way. Many harpooners are marksmen or particularly fearless freedivers but few survive long enough for their reputation to become wildly known. I can imagine it's a dangerous thing to get into. Jesus. Look at this. The Boatman. A fixture of every floating graveyard, these grim sailors ferry the dead out to their final resting place. Whoa. So they're like undertakers of the sea. Interesting. Tools of the trade. The most skilled monster hunters know the old ways are often the best. Following the traditions of the Serpent Isles, these cunning traps and vicious hooks are each crafted for luring and slaying specific creatures and such implements will be passed down from generation to generation. Oh my god, some of those weapons are just crazy, aren't they? This is like a saw. This is a crazy blade. Look at this one. Look at that jagged one. I have no idea what that's for. And a spear. A spear. That's crazy. Love that. So that was Bilge Water. Let's click in here and let's go down here. The Makaboros. Central to Bahuru culture. Nakaboros god, life, growth, and perpetual motion. Also known as the Mother Serpent. The Great Kraken! What? Or the bearded lady. She is commonly just depicted as an enormous monstrous head with many sprawling tentacles. Yep, that's the Kraken. That's the Kraken, dude. What the frick? Monsters of the Deep, Great Kraken of Bilgewater. It is unknown whether the sea monsters around Bilgewater inspire the beliefs in the Mother Serpent or vice versa. Nonetheless, Leviathans have become a staple in Bilgewater's varied cultures. Oh my god. And look at the size comparison as well. Like, there's a little ship. Well, with happy little pirates. And then they see these big fuck all eyes. And they're like, holy shit on a stick. It goes all the way down here. That's so scary. That's the kind of stuff that makes me terrified of the ocean, you know. You never know. You never know what's in the ocean. Ooh, that's scary. <laughs> um, we have Bilgewater Bay, the city of Bilgewater. Oh, look at this. Oh my god, these are wallpapers. These are actual wallpapers. Surrounded by treacherous straits and towering cliffs, Bilgewater Bay is a dangerous... Is, da is as dangerous as those who call it home. Visitors are often seduced by seemingly limitless opportunity and become permanent residents, realizing that the, lo the longer they stay, the more they can exploit others for power and wealth. Look at that. Oh, it's gorgeous. I love everything about this. Bilgewater's lowest, low, lowliest inhabitants dwell in labyrinth of meandering canals and hidden inlets. With no separation between the homes they build and the sea where they ply their trade. Indeed, traversing Pirellius waters is not just an occupational hazard, but a part of daily life. High and dry. Look at this. There is a commonly accepted truth in Bilgewater. The higher you climb, the less likely you are to drown. Those with money in their pocket will frequently will frequent the uptown tra ta taverns. Enjoying the drinks and merry conversation, even though in a day or two they will be back down at the wharf, wrangling a crew for their next dismissal or dismal voyage. Oh, God. There's so much to explore in this vast universe that Riot Games created. It's it's crazy. Like look at this. Guardian Sea? What what is that? Oh my god, I'm just fanboying. Repurposed materials look at that how do you how do how do people live like that that's crazy uh, various settlements within the greater city have been built upon the remains of a far older civilization long abandoned temples have been converted into homes and places of business with scaffolds walkways leading from one establishment to another a new beginning Lacking natural resources for construction, much of Bilgewater has been built up with whatever people can bring, find or steal, be it repurposed mas mas masonry or even the broken hulls of the ships they travelled in. Whoa. 
Slaughter Docks. What the hell is this? The Slaughter Docks. Sea monsters' attacks are con concentrate around bilge water. But over the years, um, rad lucrative industries have grown out of hunting and harassing the massive creatures. Whoa. Vessels haul them back to port to be rendered down into meat, oils, hides, armored scales, even bones and teeth for sale at the primary dockside markets. It's crazy, and as a, as a species, human beings always find a way to take down the biggest of creatures. That's why we always stay on top of the food chain. Like, you know, size is one thing, but brains is another. Carving bays. Look at that! They're literally carving a sea monster! What the fuck? From McCreegan's Kill House to the renowned outfits at Blood Harbor, slaughter docks operate day in, day and night to turn death into profit. Only the most successful captains can ever hope to run their own docks. So most, so, so most are forced to haggle for the best deal before their prize begins to rot in the water. <gasps> Crazy! Like they're literally gutting a sea monster. Slaughtered sheds. What? No way. Carving bays. S Whoa! Look! Whoa! Sea beast, monster industry of Bilgewater. Jesus Christ, look at that. Humans just have no mercy. Wow! That's. That is crazy. Wharf rats. What's this? Ooh, it looks like a shark. He's got like a shark's head. Ugh, that's a nasty creature. Monster hunting. This should be interesting. Serpent collars. Bilgewater shores are protected by the horns that, when blown, uh, disorient the waves through the waters to disguise Bilgewater locations from the sea. To oh, okay, that's interesting. Harpoon mistress, culture of Bilgewater. Whoa. I love all this. Um, the Serpent Isles. Whoa. While much of the Valoran knows the archipelago as the Blue Flame Isles to the indigenous peoples of Buhuru, or Buhuru, they have only ever been the Serpent Isles. Buhuru's ancient culture is highly respected, reflected, and sometimes limited in the daily life of Bilgewater, including traditional medicine and monster hunting techniques serpent collar whoa look at this guy that's so cool buru temple environments of bilgewater okay so that is bilgewater explored lads that's so cool and now we're on piltover and zon we're coming to the end of this part guys can't wait for part two i'm excited to explore that upper end but let's see what we got here. So, we have Zahn and Piltover. Um, we're going to see what this is. Dual city states that control the major trade routes between Valoran and Shurima home both the uh, visionary inven inventors and their wealthy patrons. The divide between social cl classes is become more dangerous. So this is somewhat of a border. Um, connected cities. Let's click into this. Look at this. Wow. That is so cool. So now, we're going to click into Zahn. Okay, so, Zahn has Jinx. This is where she's from. Polluted under city. Oh, man. I got excited for one of them. Because this one's quite famous, Jinx. She's the first legend I was kind of introduced to in my videos. Um, Echo Twitch. We literally got a guy called Twitch. Um, Blitzcrank, Dr. Mundo, oh shit, Janna, Singed, and Urgot, ooh, I'm going to click plus four, Victor, Warwick, Zack, and Ziggs, they're all from here, Zahn is a polluted undercity beneath Piltover, once united they are now separate, symbiotic, symbiotic cultures, stiff, 
Stifled uh, inventors often find their unorthodox research welcomed in Zon, but reckless industry has rendered whole uh, swathes of the city highly toxic. Even so, thanks to thriving black market, uh, chemtech and mechanical augmentation, the people still find ways to prosper. Whoa, we have all these different... Okay, below the surface. Look at that. The Zon Grey. The outsider's atmosphere of Zon is thick and the heavy with burning chemical aftertaste of Zon Grey, but the locals' upper air is too thin and it's insubstantial. Look at this shit, dude. Life survives in the depth. Through swathes of Zon are little bit better polluted slums and other... Others are all but undertaken with steel and stone. Living things still find a way to grow. Sons wealthy maintain isolated crystal houses know, known as cultivars, which contain life-giving trees and plants as both a symbol of their power and source of clean air. Whoa. Boundary markets. The levels where division between Zon and Pletover pl blurs are home to thriving markets and commercia halls. These areas are the most cosmopolitan of the city, where people from all walks of life and levels of the society can be found. So cool! Zon's Depths! Whoa! Most of Zon's structures are crafted from lattice ironwork, either forged in the many seething foundries of wrath from scavenged material discarded from above through their there is brutal functionality to the bolts and rivets of Zahn's structures. Its inhabitants still manage to craft breathtaking wonders that pierce the smog and reach for the sky. Lights and shadows. Although much of Zahn lies in the shadows of towering cliffs, it is not a city of gloom. Chem lights uh, burn in bolted scones and through creative use of colored glass, polished steel light wheels bring light to the depths. Oh, I love this. So cool. Uh, promenade letter level. People of Zon. The upper reaches of Zon exist alongside the lower districts of Piltover. Through this differing architecture means the two could never be confused. This is where the wealthy of Zon gather to shop, dine, and trade goods and supplies from below. Look at this. Look at them. Look at the character designs. Wow. Look at her! Jesus! Some breather with Greer Helm. Look at that. Whoa. Promenade President. Enstrasaw level. Deep in Zon, brokers, dealers, traffickers, and entertainers mingle in cliff dung trading posts and workshops. This is where the Zon Grey tends to linger most, and Zonities living here would claim these level where the majority of the work that allows the city to function takes place. So we got the upper class, middle class, and we'll, we'll get to the lower class. Promenade couriers. Okay. Assassins for hire. Interesting folk. All right. So now we're going to sump level. Alright, so this is the lower class. The depths of Zon are amongst the most squalid yet vibrant parts of the city. The Zon Grey has its origin here, rising from rank waterways or venting from corroded grillies. Sump Snipe. The short life expectancy of Zon workers results in a great many orphans. Aww, some snipes can be found begging, stealing or earning a coin in places where their small size is an advantage. What the hell? Mechanician? Mechanician? Me me mechanician? Mechanician. I think I got that right. Augmented me mechanicians are trained to repair searing hot pipes in the most dangerous parts of the zone. But do you replace these arms with machinery or is that a suit? Chemjack. When the pipes of Zon are backed up with toxic sludge, the Chemjacks use their canker spars to unblock them. Armored faceplates are a must because their our Alm house already has its share of blinded and burned chemjacks. Jesus Christ. Oh, look at this guy. Vigil Knot. Employed by chem barons to sur sur no, supervise the stilt-walking some scrapers and factory workers, Vigil Knot to make sure that 
unfortunates don't try to keep anything valuable for themselves. Oh, so they're kind of like the guards. Holy shit. Some scraper. Nothing is wasted in Zon. And even the toxic hinterlands of the sums can be churned for salvage. These toxic environments are too hostile for an unprotected human. So some scrapers make their living wading through the wastes on iron stills. Oh god, these are these are tough, tough jobs. Now we have chem barons. Whoa. A loose alliance of convenience exists between Zon's powerful chem barons, powerful individuals who each control an area of the city. It is they and their thugs who keep Zon from descending, descending into chaos. Baron Velveteen Lanier. Whoa. A chem baron who many businesses interest in Piltover. Lanier deals mainly in research into Gollum technology. Her ravaged body was dying, so she had her head transplanted to a Hextech-powered replacement. She visits Piltover regularly for fluid baths and flood. How, how, how did that even work? Baron Petrick. So these people are like part machine. Grime lost both in his arms explosion one of his... Oh my god. Chem refineries, despite or perhaps because of this, his Chemtech stock is some of the most sought after blends. Baron Sada Takeda. Takeda is, has made no secret of his disdain for his fellow Chem Barons. Claiming lineage from an exiled caste of warriors from a distant land, he has plans far beyond his own territories and interests. Baron Wencher Spin Spindlow? Once lowly lieutenant Splindler murdered his boss and took over his empire. Armed with a pair of shock buttons, he is ruthless killer who is who sees murder and mayhem as tools of the trade. Look at that face. Jesus. Those teeth. Okay. So that was the Chem Barons. Now we have the Chem Punks. Okay. Interesting. Through the majority of troublemaking, gangs form in the lower reaches of Zon. Their members come from every level of the city and pilt over too. Okay. And now finally we have Chemtech. Chemtech, tools of Zon. Denied the funds and means to craft Hextech, Zon's research researchers instead use potent chemicals to power their creations. Chemtech performs like Hextech, by it, it, but it is far more dangerous, toxic and explosive. Whoa, look at that. Public hex hexdraulic descender. Travel between Zon and Piltover usually requires long and tiring climb, but for those who can afford it, passage can be bought on these towering elevators, allowing a far swifter transit. Private hexdraulic descender. Look at that. Whoa. And the weapons. Hex carbine. Sump gas nebulizer. Okay. Inte integral expo filtrator. Reusable SO filters. Whoa. That is so cool. So that is on. All right, lads. I'm going to end this part here. We're going to continue to pilt over and then we're going to branch out to the upper region of Rune Terra. And I cannot wait. We have another mountainous area. We have a place over here. So there's many more places to explore and talk about. But I think that ends this part of the video. Alright lads and ladies. So that ends this part of our exploration of Rune Terra. As you can see. This world. This land I should say. Was incredible. Exploring these different regions of Rune Terra. Has been an absolute treat. I have to applaud Riot Games. I have to applaud all of the artists involved in making this incredible world a thing to really, really delve into. And I enjoyed that, like, a lot. Everything about that was just so amusing to me. It was amusing, it was entertaining, it was, it had that shock factor. And of course, with the help of some of the images and the art, it was really something that you can imagine in your brain. You know, you can really picture this world in real life. And I just think that a lot of this stuff that we've seen needs to be explored a lot more. And I feel like 
as much as that League of Legends is the most played video game on the planet, I do feel like this world of Runeterra deserves its own thing. I feel like the fact that they went into such depths in creating origins of the people from the different regions, um, the different races of people, and, you know, the history, the wars, the beasts, the monsters. I feel like it should be something that we should be able to explore as gamers, you know. I think it should be an open world. I think it's somewhere that I want to explore myself. I want to see a 3D rendition of this world. I want to see it. And I know that's me being greedy as a gamer. I just want them to make something so amazing because they've already done the groundwork. They have built the world. It's in writing. They have the art to work off of. I feel like this could be something huge, you know, and especially as the League community really, really love the game and the lore. Because a lot of you have reached out to me and said, you don't really play League. You know, it's not really a game you like, but the lore... The lore is something completely different. It is something that you love to get your teeth into. And honestly, I enjoyed, enjoyed this so much. Like, I learned so much today from this. It was incredible. I can't wait for part two. We're going to be exploring the upper regions now. Um, but everything that we've seen in this part of the video has just been incredible. And I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, make sure you leave a like. I greatly, greatly appreciate it. And consider subscribing for part two of our exploration of Runeterra. I'm hyped as hell to record it. We have, This is a long video. I know. That's why I decided to premiere this video. So you guys can really interact with it. And enjoy it for what it is. And honestly, part two is probably going to be just as long. I don't know. Maybe it won't have as much information as the lower regions did. But it may have more. So if it does, then oh well. It's going to be another long video, but I cannot wait to get the part 2 out there for you all. If you guys are members of the channel, then part 2 will be available much sooner um, than it is for regular subscribers on the channel. So definitely consider joining the channel or alternatively, you can check out the Patreon page where I do a lot of early access stuff, especially with my anime reactions. And there's a lot of content over there that don't appear here on YouTube as well. So it's definitely something to consider. It's a brand new month, so definitely consider that. Support me and access some great rewards. Anyway, that being said, we have concluded part one of our exploration of Runeterra. Like I said, if you enjoyed the video, smash the like and subscribe if you're new. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, dudes. And as always, stay geeky, stay cool, be awesome, and be happy. And I'll see you, dudes, in my next League video. See you later, dudes.